initially the idea for most of the 20th century in radio was that you could only have seven radio stations, seven AMs or seven FMs. And that was due to the Communications Act of 1934. In the 80s, uh, Congress and the FCC came up with this thing called Docket 8090. And it, the idea was to create a whole lot more uh, radio stations, make them more available to various groups of people, create diversity. And um, they were supposed to be all low power radio stations, 3,000 watt, what they call Class A FMs. All kinds of people applied for these radio stations all over the country. Only problem with that is over time, by moving these stations around and moving other stations around, only 3,000 watt radio stations all of a sudden became 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 watt radio stations because by using engineering methods, they would move the stations around. So towns that uh, worked hard to get one radio station in a suburb, all of a sudden that was gone and was in a big city. So cities like Austin, Houston, any kind of big city in Texas, all of a sudden went from having maybe eight or 10 radio stations to having 15 or 20. Over time, uh, the FCC and, uh, raised the level to 10 and then 12, and I think maybe finally 20. And then with the Communications Act of 1996, they made it unlimited. And that's when the modern era of radio consolidation just took off and created, you know, 10 or 12 giant companies for radio. A lot of, a lot of good things came out of this consolidation. Uh, in the old days, none of us had health insurance or 401ks or that sort of thing. And consolidation created that. As far as the programming issues, at first, it was really pretty cool because all of a sudden, uh, you had all this great new equipment and that's when equipment and radio business had not changed for 30 years, 30 or 40 years, from the early 60s to the 90s. And uh, all of a sudden you had computers and were able to do all these neat keen things and it, 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 it really uh, had a positive effect. Over time, as more and more consolidation took, took place, and, and guys basically, like my mom said, their, their eyes were bigger than their stomachs when you took too much food. These guys, a lot of people paid ungodly amounts of money for these radio stations and ultimately couldn't handle the debt on them. Money got tighter and there was more and more consolidation. Finally, it started really affecting programming. More and more became more corporate control. Uh, they would uh, dictate, first of all, you could only add two or three uh, records yourself on a, on a weekly basis or however the, the, your company added them. Uh, just a few, and then and then finally uh, they got where you couldn't add any. <laughs> you played just what they had, and they did everything very very safe based on research. So it just it killed a lot of the old days. I remember when we were in Austin, uh, we got local ra local radio stations uh, used to get hundreds of records a week from people all over the country, and we got a record from a guy named Arnie Rue, and he was he played lounges in Los Angeles, and we played the record and thought it was kind of cool. And so our morning guy started playing it on the air and we created kind of a cult following for this guy, Arnie Rue. We, we finally brought him into Austin. He played the, one of the old honky tonks here, the Silver Dollar. And we had a couple thousand people come out and see him. Well, that sort of thing went far away. And it went even further away with just local groups of bands that played, you know, played forever. I remember we had a band here called the People's Choice. Well, in those days, I was here in Austin, you put out a record, you know, they would play it, we'd talk about the group and all that. All that went further and further away with this consolidation. I don't think necessarily that's what was intended to be done with it, but it, it cut out a lot of the great services at radio. It cut, they cut news departments way down. There was hardly any local news. Everything became feel-good stuff. It, it was all lifestyle-oriented things, you know. A uh, dog got locked in the car and let the owner out or whatever, rather than informative news of a local nature because they didn't have people to do it. And, and it's, um, it really stymied a lot of people in the business. It was no longer fun because in the old days, you could, you'd, these people were your friends. The musicians were your friends. The police people were your friends. The politicians were your friends. You knew all these folks. And that, that became further and further removed. And, and it really still is. And it's left largely to uh, the news part, to television. And the music part has been taken up by other media. You know, the original, uh, intent of radio was to serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Uh, that was in the uh, Communication Act of 1934, and 
all the old time radio guys learned that, you know, and that the owners were very aware of these. You had to prove you were doing that. You had to keep records. Well, records are kept today and in my experience, but they're not, they're not worried about very much. And when I started in radio in the early sixties, I think there were 1,200 radio stations in the United States. Today, I think there are around 15,000 radio stations. And the government agency, like a lot of other governmental agencies, the FCC can't really monitor and control and deal with all of those things. Uh, I think there was too much control for a long time. Today, I think there's probably too little control. All the guys that are still in the business, when I see them, all they want to do is whine about how bad it is and how it sucks. And I says, you're, you're telling Noah about the flood, brother. I think that they've lost a generation of young people who initially, as kids, everybody got their music off the radio. It's where the new music came, and that's where you learned about old music, and that's where you could, uh, by various stations specializing in different kinds of music, you know, you were, you were educated, uh, uh, whether it was you're listening to something as, as diverse as if you were an Anglo listening to Tejano music, to uh, listening to your, your uh, Frank Sinatra and uh, Tony Bennett, to George Jones and George Strait. Uh, you, you, you learned about all types of music and um, rock and roll lived off of that. You know, Top 40 and rock and roll lived off of the record right out of the box. And in my day, it was uh, a kid from Fort Worth, uh, a woman from Fort Worth and a guy from uh, Harlingen uh, cut a record called Hey Paula, and it went to number one in the 60s. And they cut it literally in a some crummy studio in Fort Worth, and it was number one record. And you had this all the time happening, and uh, sometimes they spread nationally. Texas had a lot of those guys from Ray Peterson, San Antonio, uh, what was the group? Uh, uh, question Mark of the Mysterians out of the Rio Grande Valley, uh, 96 Tears. These were all regional groups that had big giant hits all over the country in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s. And now, you know, that opportunity is gone. And that's where kids learned about the new music, and it's, it's all gone. One of the things that has led to the loss of this young generation of, of radio listeners, and I'd say they're mostly people under 25 uh, these days, uh, maybe even under 30, uh, is that is the ascension of the social media, uh, as well as every kid in the world knows how to get music off the internet. And uh, they, it's, it's instantaneous. A lot of the things radio used to serve, a lot of the purposes radio used to serve. You see it, especially, I think, and I, I can speak to my own experience in Texas, where you have this whole genre of uh, Texas musicians out there, mostly of a country vein. And they're very successful. They're college educated. They're smart. They cut their own, their own, their, they cut whatever songs they want to. They use their band or their buddies or whoever they want to. Uh, a lot of them do it in Austin, San Antonio, wherever. Houston is done everywhere. Then they uh, have a nice circuit they play from uh, Amarillo to Lubbock to uh, College Station to Kingsville to Corpus Christi or whatever. And they sell those CDs for, you know, 15, 20 bucks a piece. And I guess they keep about 95% of whatever it cost. And they're very successful. They have a cadre of loyal listeners that go around. And so they've captured the new technology and 90% of what these guys do, not on the radio. The, these new musicians that have this music are the only ones that are very successful in the old uh, local club venues anymore. You know, they... Uh, that, that they can afford to see, so the kids all know them. And I think it's as much, that's a result of, the, of the, these new musicians, these Texas country guys, if you will, have, have, have grasped the new technology and really made it work for them.